check. One, two, three. The D. Three. Three. Yeah. This is the D. Three. Go. Your guide to Detroit. Your guide to Detroit's art. Arts and entertainment scene. This is the D. Brief. Welcome to the debrief for the week of June fourth, two thousand eighteen. I am your co-host. My name is Seth Ressler. Hi, I'm Becky Scarsalo, and I'm Jag. It is June, guys. Crazy! All of a sudden, it went from like Bam. snow to like a week of rain, and then now it's like ninety degrees. Oh, oh you, you poor California native! You're not used to seasons. I know, I'm not used silly to this. boy. <laughs> I am really not. Uh, all right, we've got an exciting show for you today. We have uh, a number of people on it. We have our good friend Bailey Sisoy Isgro of Detroit History Tours and the Detroit History Club. She's going to school us, I'm yes. sure. Uh, good stuff. Does. Well, we've heard rumors about what's going on with Ford and the train station mm-hmm. over in Corktown. Swirling, swirling. We're going to yeah. see if she knows anything. And, and she certainly, might. She might. Certainly she knows the backstory. Oh, yes, yes. Expert analysis. Uh, also, we have a fan, guys. We have a guy. We have a fan. A fan. It's hard to believe. We have a fan. Uh, his name is Matt Kirshner, and he's doing something very cool. He's got a very cool project to help the homeless. Awesome. And okay. he actually emailed us about this and said, hey, I've been listening to this podcast for, for months and months and months, uh, and I would love to talk to you about it. So we're going to talk to him as well as somebody else who is involved with the project. Uh, his name is Bernard Bentley. That's his nickname. I need a cool nickname like that's that. That's a really good name. Yeah. Uh, he runs the streetwear company called Love Life Swagger. That's Also uh, a great name. Yeah, on Gratiot downtown. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, want to let you know that on our Thursday episode, we're going to have Dave Waite of Motor City Pride. This is just a ginormous event. Event this weekend in town it is it you know all over it's it's such a cool event i want to hear more about it yes so uh check that out on thursday and by the way we have an amazon alexa skill if you own an echo all you have to do is say alexa enable the debrief podcast and you can now listen to this podcast and we've broken it up into bite-sized chunks so you get a different piece on monday and tuesday and wednesday and thursday some little you know like five minutes ten minutes something to start your day so that every morning when you get up all you have to do is say alexa Alexa, play the debrief podcast. I like that. We're getting into your morning routine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, get, get you going. You get a little bit of us in your life. Uh, and of course, coming up on the rest of the episode, we've got all the information about Detroit concerts, comedy, plays, food, and drink. Stick around. The debrief. The debrief. <laughs> Sports report. All right, Jag, let's start with the sports. Lots going on this week. Uh, some really cool stuff. Of course, we had the Detroit Grand Prix over the weekend. Brought a ton of money and notoriety to the city. Scott Dixon won the Saturday race. Ryan Hunter Ray won the Sunday race. And he celebrated by diving into Scott Fountain with a bottle of champagne. I saw that. Went. How yeah. cool is that? Uh, the other big story from the Grand Prix over the weekend, GM's VP of Product Development, Mark Royce, or Roos, I believe it is, R-E-U-S-S, he was driving the pace car. So the way these, I know you guys aren't racing fans per se, but the way these races start is a pace car that's usually some really exotic car gets them going up to a certain speed to heat up the tires and heat up the brakes and get the cars ready and the pace car pulls off and everything goes. I understand. My sex is the same way for me. Crickets. And then, uh, and then, um, so what happened was, so this guy, Mark Roos, he wiped out and the car that he was driving was a $120,000 Corvette ZR1 755 horsepower car, which is just insane. Like a sexy beast car. It was. And I mean, and so that was the big joke over the weekend was, oh, <laughs> the big VP at GM wrecked this exotic car. Well, Whoops. a piece came out in the free press on Monday kind of defending him because it's wet. A sports car with that much power is really hard to handle. And he's one of like 15 people at GM as an engineer that was so certified to even drive this car. Oh, so wow. so it wasn't really his fault, but it ended up being a big thing on social media and all over that. Oh. Guess what? The VP at GM wiped out the prototype Corvette. I assume that's covered by insurance. <laughs> Let's you, hope. Can, you, can you imagine what that insurance costs in Detroit? No. Oh, <laughs> it's probably a lot. Because I know what like a Ford Escort costs. <laughs> right. Yeah. A 755 horsepower <laughs> Corvette ZR1. Yeah, so we wiped out and spun out and took a little crap for it, uh, apologized on Monday, and you know, well, these things happen. Now people know his name. <laughs> Right, <laughs> not, not for the right reasons. Um, on another note, the Rally Goose. Have you guys heard about the Rally Goose? This is the big thing with the Tigers this week. Wow, nothing. Uh, nothing. Wow. Is right. it like the like those cement geese that people dress up? No, 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 no. Is it, they, a, is it a goose that lays eggs and then 
little kids go and hunt for them, and then they find baskets with other chocolate geese inside. What are you smoking, and can I have some? <laughs> I know. That All right. sounds fun. So, that would be a silly holiday. Oh, gosh. Last Wednesday night, the Tigers were losing, and a goose showed up on the field, like one of those Canadian geese oh. that get like real aggressive. Yeah. Yes. Well, they kind of shoot it off the field, and it took off, and it flew into the stands, and... Right in one of the ribbon scoreboards, the big light-up scoreboard. Oh. Smacks. That's so weird. It's not like it's a window. Like, no, it just... no. It was like a red and blue lit up with some advertisement. Oh. It just, and then so everybody had kind of gasped, and I tweeted this from the debrief uh, Twitter, if you haven't seen it, at the debrief on Twitter. It smashes into the scoreboard, falls, and the announcer's uh-huh. gasping, but then it gets up and it's walking around, oh. and then and then the... the like shrugging it off. Like, yeah, oh, I'm know, okay. I'm, I'm meant okay. to do that. Yeah, I'm meant yeah. Yeah, Comerica cool. Park, like staff got him and brought him in, and they flashed it up on the scoreboard later that game. The goose is okay. Uh. We re-released him into the wild. So okay. this became known as the Rally Goose because after that happened, the Tigers came back and won the game and won four games in a row. Oh. So this became this big thing where the, the the Rally Goose would be shown on the scoreboard if they were losing. And now the players have a little plastic goose they carry around in the dugout, in the clubhouse as <laughs> a good luck charm. And... Uh, and, and the rally goose become a thing. I went to the Tigers game on Monday afternoon, and they were losing. They flashed uh-huh. the rally goose out there. Unfortunately, it didn't work. It doesn't oh, work shoot. every time. But, uh, but they were playing the Yankees. So the, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the Anaheim Angels have the rally monkey, so now the Tigers have the rally goose. Goose. Oh. Just don't upset the goose. <laughs> Seth and you been, wonder why I think sports is silly. I, I I'm know. trying to bring it to your level to give me a, a whole other way of appreciating. <laughs> He's dumbing it. down the sport. Smart. If this goose were smart, it would have found a way to parlay this into season tickets. You know, just say <laughs> for, uh, all the, for, right. for all this. What do you call them? Geese, baby geese. Yeah, you got to work the angles. Goslings. Yes, goslings. Like they, little Ryan goslings. Like little Ryan's. <laughs> Make way for goslings. Uh, late news Monday night, the Tigers had the first pick in the 2018 Major League Baseball draft, the first overall pick, and they took a picture from. Auburn named Casey Mize, who's supposed to be obviously really good. He's the first pick in the draft, so that could be a star in the future. Does he it's, like geese? We'll find out, won't we? Yeah. <laughs> Assuming they don't trade him away. Uh, we always like it when um, when local teams bring up people from the area, keep things in-house, in-state. Well, mm-hmm. after the Pistons, after they allegedly were talking to the Michigan State head coach, now they're talking to Michigan coach John Beeline. He's hot after a couple of runs to the Final Four. Talk of maybe Michigan, you know, Michigan's coach going to the Pistons. But this is to me, this doesn't work because when you have a college coach, most of them fail in the NBA. Real simple, why? You're used to dealing with 18 and 19 year old kids and molding young minds. Uh-huh. And then you go to dealing with these guys that are making 15 and $20 million a year. They're not going to listen to you. Whole different. Right. Mm-hmm. So if they want to bring in a good coach, in my opinion, they need to bring in somebody with NBA experience. They have talked to Jason Kidd, who was just fired by Milwaukee. They just made the playoffs. They got to get somebody with professional uh, But, but on obviously, their not everybody can start with professional experience. At some point, you've got to have somebody who moves up the ranks from well, somewhere Well, sure, else. but we don't want to deal with it. I'm just not yeah, here. Not, not in my backyard. No. No, no, no. Have it be an assistant coach that's like worked under an NBA coach uh, somewhere. That makes but, sense. But it, it, oh, okay. the college coach thing never works. Don't go straight to the top. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to try to get through this next story without choking up, but this is this is just a wild story. So uh, Waterford, Mott, and Lakeland have a big high school baseball rivalry here. It gets pretty intense from time to time. But uh, last week, there, uh, or early in the season, actually, this article came in the Sunday Free Press uh, by Jeff Seidel. It was a great piece. Um Waterford Mott's uh, infielder, Grant Johnson, uh, was going after a ground ball. It was hit very hard. He instinctively dove for the ball. The ball took a funny hop, bounced up, hit him in the face, oh. right between the nose and the mouth. Um, and it was really, really bad. He oh. was, uh, there was a, a lot, I'll save the, save the gory details, but okay. there was a lot of blood. He went into a seizure. Oh. He lost consciousness. Somebody from the stands who knew CPR came running in to help him um, and then realized when they rolled it over, it was his mom. It was her son that was on the field. <gasps> Jeez. Um, and and it, 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 this big rivalry of these teams that just really didn't get along. By the end of the game, they were in a. They, were, they called off the rest of the game. Obviously, they were, they all prayed together, and it was a really really scary moment. Um, fortunately, Grant Johnson, the player that was hurt. He was taken by EMT to the hospital. Um, he had a severe grade three concussion, which is the most serious concussion you can have. Um, but after a few days, he was released. Um, he's obviously done for the season. He's not cleared to play the rest sure. of his senior year. He's going to lose the rest of his senior year, unfortunately. Oh. But more importantly, he's okay. He still has some light sensitivity and some concussion symptoms. But against doctor's advice and against the wishes of his mom, he is in the dugout with his team every game the rest of the year. He, oh, he can't wow. play, but he's there as sort Sitting of a spiritual leader. 
culture um, to rally the team around. And it, a story that could have been much, much Very worse tragic. had a, a, a really happy ending. And you said you, you were at a game where something like this happened once? Uh, actually, my nephew, when he was a kid, when he was playing um, ball, he got hit in the head. <sighs> and it was very severe and scary. Yeah. You've seen this in, you know, in the major leagues when these balls, you know, pitchers throw a ball 100 miles an hour. Yeah. It comes back off the bat even faster. And it's, it's a very, very scary thing. That's why, and again, being at the Tigers game on Monday, the netting is bigger this year. It goes further out from home plate toward oh. first and third base because to, even those sure. if you're sitting in the stands those foul balls come at you yeah. 100 something miles an hour if you're not paying attention it can end very badly so right. baseball it's America's pastime it's a great sport but it can be very very dangerous mm-hmm. if you're not paying attention so uh, really again scary stuff there but a happy ending for, uh, for Waterford and Lakeland um, they've really come together over this uh, finally, Tigers are in Boston through Thursday. They're home against the Cleveland Indians this weekend. Uh, and cool promotion, one of the cooler promotions they do during the year. It's a Negro Leagues weekend. The annual Negro League tribute game is Saturday. And giveaways include a Detroit Stars Negro Baseball League hat the, to the first 10,000 fans on Saturday. If you want to check that out, grab a souvenir on Saturday afternoon. Coming up, we're going to talk about the concerts happening in the Detroit area. The D. Bring History Lesson. All right, Becky, Jag. Uh, every once in a while, we like to check in with uh, Bailey Sisoy Isgro. She runs uh, Detroit History Tours and the Detroit History Club. She's, she's been, you, know, you guys have talked to her before. Oh, yeah. She's been she knows of the show. way more about Detroit history than any of us, yeah. well, all of us combined. We, friend sure. of the pod. Right. We bring her in because we really don't we know really what don't we're know. talking about. Right, so, right. so, Bailey, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, everybody. And we have you on the phone because, what, there, there's no power where you are? Yeah, you know, it's summer and people are cranking the air conditioning, and I guess this is the result. It's not like a warm day, though, today. What's going on? Cumulative effects from all the 90 degree days last week, I, I know. Guess. It's like playing catch up. I know. Strange. You know, sometimes being in my little slice of heaven, Highland Park, Detroit, stuff just goes wrong for no good reason. <laughs> well, that, that is true. All right. Well, while we've got you on the line, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, you know, there's all these rumors about what's going on with Ford and the train station. Uh, first of all, what have you heard? And second of all, you know, can you give us some history behind this place? Perspective. Yeah. I mean, the rumors are swir- swirling. This is the thing everyone's talking about. On May 23rd, warrant deeds were uh, recorded at the Wayne County Recording Office for Michigan Central Station, which I think everybody calls the Detroit train station. They transferred ownership from Maddie Maroon's company over to a group called New Investment Properties, LLC, out of New York City. The deeds were for Michigan Central Station and the Detroit Public Schools Book Depository Building, which is just behind it. Um, The property holding group, the LLC, is being linked to the Ford Motor Company, and the Ford Motor Company just last year moved 2,000 employees down to Corktown. And so everyone's sort of swirling that word is coming that the Fords are going to try to come back to Detroit in a really big way by taking over the train station, which has been empty since 1988 when Amtrak stopped service. Wow. So this would be a big deal. You say come back to Detroit. I mean, how long has it been since Ford was in Detroit? Well, Ford's always had a Detroit stronghold, but they left Detroit for Dearborn. So when Ford... um, Originally started, they started in 1903 next week, June 16th. Ford Motor Company was formed on Woodward Avenue in uh, the Malcolmson building. It was Alexander Malcolmson. He was a Scotsman. He was a friend of Henry Ford's from back when they both worked at Edison Electric. And he helped Henry Ford by putting up $500 along with 12 other men. They raised $28,000, and Ford Motor Company was founded in Detroit. He went on to have the Cat Avenue factory the Highland Park Ford factory, and the Rouge factory, all in Detroit. Henry Ford II in the 1960s builds what uh, the Renaissance Center, which is now under General Motors' control here in Detroit. But it is really the push to Dearborn and putting their world headquarters in Dearborn that does, in a way, symbolically take Ford out of Detroit. Um, the family themselves, huge involvement. They're huge supporters of the DIA and the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. So they've always been here, but that headquarters just west of town um, might be coming to a little bit of a change. Now, is the rumor that the headquarters are going to be in the train station, or you think it's going to be something else? You know, I've heard three big rumors, and I can't tell you which one is true. I've heard everything from 
the entire Ford Motor Company is going to close down their Dearborn operations and move it all to the train station. Becky's shaking her head. Becky doesn't think that's going to happen. No, that's (laughs) it. I don't either, because what it would do is it would effectively turn Dearborn into what Highland Park became when Chrysler left. It's such a massive campus out there. Yes, and they've invested so much on Michigan Avenue and Dearborn. I really don't think that's true. The rumor I'm tempted to believe is that they're going to turn it into their auto- autonomous vehicle headquarters, mm. possibly mixed-use educational, mixed-use conference center with some sort of restaurant and commercial space on the lower concourse floor, similar to what General Motors did with Dorinson. Develop the entire building, own the entire building, use the space they want, kind of take the naming rights, but then rent out the rest of the building to other facilities that work with them. I would think there's a certain like, sexy aspect to that, Bailey, where you have, if you're Ford and you want to bring in, in national and international clients and business partners to deal, you show them this brand new renovated building with all the history and the train station, and you're in that area of Corktown. You've got two James and you've got uh, Slows and you've got all that right there. I would think that'd be kind of a big sell for them. Absolutely. And when you have the big three, especially Ford and General Motors, fighting for quality employees, it's a big yep. selling point to the young, up-and-coming designers and engineers and, and admin and women to say, hey, guys, don't you want to work in Corktown? Don't you want to be right in the middle of it all in downtown Detroit with your job? It's a great selling feature. And Definitely. The, and and the other, would, go ahead, Becky. Oh, just it would just make so much more financial sense to them, too, not to have – I mean, that's a huge building. To fill it with all your people would be, would be kind of crazy of a model. So to have other businesses in there would make a lot of sense. I also think it defeats a little bit of the purpose because when you have a show place, you want people to come see it. If they turn it into world headquarters, I'd have to imagine there'd be some security involved with that. Right. Where, you know, the average tour guide on the street couldn't take a group into the concourse and talk about this building that opened in 1913 when the train station caught fire and they had to push a building. The building was supposed to wasn't supposed to open for another full year. They had to push it ahead 11 months and get it open, get it into service because we lost our other train station to a fire. I think for the Ford Motor Company to be able to open up at least the concourse level, the ticketing level to the general public, we're going to see restaurants and bars, maybe a hotel aspect, the way the Renaissance building is. The last rumor, which um, is an interesting one, is that it could be a show place with the Ford name on it that incorporates a theater, a conference center, and sort of a hotel aspect so that when we have the Renaissance Center uh, for the General Motors headquarters during the auto show, Ford has an equal show place as sort of their headquarters Uh, for conferences. hmm. And Pink has a place to do her show when she reschedules for next year. Yep, and to your point, I I believe it was Chad who said it, it's a huge showpiece. It's a jewel on a crown for Ford Motor Company to be able to say on an international level that they brought back this building. I think the family, too, and the company has a sense, like General Motors did when they did the rents, and that this city, you know, it's a part of this city. And I think they would want to honor that and have it be open to the people. Well, too. let's talk about that train station for a minute here, because that was once, you know, a huge symbol of everything that was going right in Detroit. And then it kind of became this <laughs> icon of ruin porn. Wrong, yeah. And uh, yeah, and it kept showing up in movies and things like that to, you know, when people needed, oh, we need a decayed building. Let's use the train station in Detroit. Talk a little bit about the history well, of it. Oddly enough, it's largely due to the big automobile companies that the train station started to climb. Correct. When it was built in 1913, construction started in 1911. It was the tallest train station in the world at 18 stories. It opened in World War One through World War Two. It saw 200 trains a day. It was a main train station on the Vanderbilt line. And it was done by the same architectural team as Central Station in New York City. In every way, it was supposed to kind of be the sister station to the other great Vanderbilt line, the New York line. So for the train station, the advent of the Motor City and cars in Detroit really affected the use of the trains. And the big flaw is a flaw we're seeing in Detroit today. They didn't accommodate for light rail, short distances, and people having a place to park and get on the train to ride. 
So it meant that really following World War II, as our, our expressways built up in Michigan, as people developed ways to commute into work, the train traffic slowly declined, and in 1988, it saw its last car. The building itself is absolutely incredible, though. As I said, it won every architectural award. It was recognized as the tallest train station in the world. And it's really held this iconic place in Detroit for that short little time when we had the movies um, and the movie incentives. Batman versus Superman, uh, Transformers, um, Real Steel all had uh, scenes at the train station. It's also, you know, the place people take their wedding photos with this sort of decaying building in the background which breaks my heart a little bit because some of my favorite photos show the, the veterans of World War II coming home. If you lived in Chicago, New, uh, Chicago, Indiana, Wisconsin, or Michigan, and you were coming home from World War II, 75% of those guys came back through Michigan Central Station. Wow. Huh. So I think it's got a real place in the hearts and minds of generations of Detroiters it would be uh, something real special to see it come back again. Definitely. In talking about all the different rumors uh, that you've heard about this, Bailey, one of the other ru- things that I've heard when you talk about autonomous vehicles, that the idea would be that the autonomous or electric or urban vehicles would be headquartered in the station and in the adjacent buildings they've bought because that's really the urban area. That would be the perfect testing ground for you know smaller vehicles that would be you know more useful in tight urban areas like as Corktown's coming up. Would you agree with that? Oh my gosh, that just seems logical. Absolutely. I mean, you you want to test something like that in the most rigorous conditions. That's why they do so many vehicle tests in San Francisco. Yeah. Heavy traffic, inclines and declines. You know, maybe it'll help us get our roads fixed. Yeah, you know, Bailey, I was out at CES in Las Vegas uh, back in January, and the one thing that really stood out to me was that all the car companies were there, and they were trying to position themselves not as car companies, but as transportation companies, and particularly for cities, that all of a sudden there was going to be car sharing, and there was going to be ride sharing, and electric bikes, and scooters, and all these different ways of getting around, and that if the car companies wanted to stay in the transportation game, they were going to have to think beyond the car. I think that is so exciting because, you know, Becky can back me up on this. The more history you know, the funnier the world gets because it's kind of like having a fortune teller. You go, well, I've seen this play out before. Exactly, that's true. Yeah, in World War II when they told Detroit, look, no more civilian cars. You're not allowed to produce them. We need all that material going to the war effort. Detroit becomes the arsenal of democracy before they shut off civilian car manufacturing. But following the end of World War II, we took everything we learned building tanks and suits and amphibious vehicles. It's not like they threw all that knowledge in the trash can. They used it to build what a lot of car historians will tell you is the greatest generation of cars, the the 1950s product years. The cars that had the most amazing and new and and, um, revolutionary technology. So to see the car companies sort of as a whole turning for the first time since post-World War II and saying, okay, we've got to concentrate on something other than single-driver civilian cars. Holy moly, that's getting exciting. Well, and it harkens back to what Detroit's been all about, you know, being the cutting edge, being the leaders in innovating and manufacturing. Well said. All right. Well, uh, Bailey, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to join us, especially I know you're there without any electricity. We appreciate you calling. Yes, anyway, thank you. You got anything you yeah, want to... I can't apologize enough for the phone quality, but it's always a pleasure <laughs> to talk to you guys. You got anything you want to plug? What you got coming up? What's uh, on tap for the summer? Saturday night. If you don't have planned Saturday night, um, we are taking over world-famous uh, Burt's Entertainment Complex in Detroit's Eastern Market. It's a $50 ticket. You can get it at DetroitHistoryClub.com. With that, you get a fantastic barbecue dinner, which Bert's is famous for. Mr. Bert Deering himself is coming to lecture on the history of African-American music and food in Detroit. I'm going to be talking about how Eastern Market has changed over the last 150 years and how it has sort of hosted great places like Bert's. We're going to have a great dinner. We're going to dance. The concerts for that evening are included in your ticket price. So we hope to see you Saturday. Oh, that's awesome. If people have electricity and can get on the internet, (laughs) how can they find out more about it? DetroitHistoryClub.com. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Bailey. We appreciate you checking in. Thanks very much, guys. Have a good one. This is the D, 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 D. 
concert calendar. Becky, let's get into the music. Let's do it. It's all about the outdoor jams. Uh, Wednesday, June 6th, Dave Matthews Band at DTE. Smoke them if you got them. Bring your Funyuns. All of that. Have you guys seen them? No, I haven't. Have you? No. I saw him the very first stadium show I think he ever did, which was in Boston. Oh, no way. That was yeah. at the old Foxborough Stadium? Yeah. Uh, Beck opened up, and so did Ben Folds. Uh, oh, and it, that'd be good. It was, you know, it was yeah. a good show. I mean, everybody was drunk. The girl, you know, in the row in front of us just squatted and peed right there oh, on the chair. I mean, yeah. was, was there a, was there good, a cloud? Was there a, I mean, that's the stereotype of a Dave Matthews concert. Was there a giant, like, weed cloud above the show? I mean, that's almost every yeah. show. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's them all. Yeah. Right. Know. You know, you yeah. don't think that happens at a Snoop Dogg oh, show? These, these kids all. smoking their reefer. I don't know. All the time. Uh, Thursday, June 7th. Okay, this starts a series. I love these series. Uh, jazz on the Riverwalk. Free shows every Thursday, 7 to 10. So it's jazz, soul, funk, a little bit of everything, but tending towards the jazz. Um, so it starts this week. It goes through August 30th. You're going to want to go to Robert's Riverwalk Hotel to watch those uh friday june 8th poison and cheap trick at dt it's another one i've seen i have seen not cheap trick but i've seen poison and uh this was so much fun we just went and we tailgated like we did it oh yeah. Yeah, those, yeah yeah you know warrant was on the bill and i think <laughs> queen's course, was on the bill and course. so you white just, snake right so we just made a point of getting cheap beer and sitting in the parking lot forever i will say poison okay. is incredibly well choreographed there was a moment oh. <laughs> where Brett Michaels had this uh, guitar and did like a guitar solo or something and then threw it to the side of the stage and it twirled in air and there was a tech on the side Ready of the stage. Ready to catch it. Just caught just it effortlessly seamless. and put it down. And I was just like, that was cool. I have to tell you about my connection to Poison real quick. So my okay. college roommate, Bill, was a diehard Poison fan. He was the biggest poison fan ever um and he was actually killed by a drunk driver in 2006 and we oh. told poison about it hey he was a big fan of yours yeah. poison sent neon green and purple flowers to the funeral like wow. after after we wrote really? to them and years later probably about four or five years ago when i was in new orleans brett michaels did a solo show and i interviewed him on the phone ahead of the show and i told him the story uh-huh. and he said um we choked up here he said um he goes oh that that's that's a really cool story man why don't you come out and hang backstage with me before the show so i did um, and I thanked him, and he goes, hey, um, I'm going to dedicate uh, a song to your friend. Wow. He did the show, and his the Poison song, Something to Believe In, Yeah, he dedicated to Fallen Soldiers, and uh, Bill Leaf was a really good friend of ours and really loved our band. And I have video. I'm videoing it from the side stage. He played the whole song and dedicated it to my best friend who was killed by a drunk driver, and it, it was that it is, was a wow. moment for me. What That's a nice awesome. guy. Wow. That's amazing. So another outdoor venue, Shane Park, you know, has this whole series uh, this summer, too. So Saturday, June 9th, Janae Aiko is going to be there. Yeah, what's the deal with her? She's a hip-hop artist, kind of like dreamy hip-hop, super great voice, done a lot of collaborations with a lot of people, great sound. Um, Scott Bradley's Postmodern Jukebox, also Saturday, June 9th. It's part of this downtown Ann Arbor summer festival. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs to check this out because it goes through the 4th of July. Tons of great performances for weeks in various venues, including Top of the Park. Uh, Sunday, June 10th, Paul Simon's at DTE. Apparently, farewell tour for him. Uh, Monday, June 11th, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Say that three times fast. At the Majestic Theater. Uh, Tuesday, June 12th, 30 Seconds to Mars is at DTE. This is another guy. I mean, this is Jared Leto. Jared Leto's Who everybody knows from. Oh, uh, yeah. What that was thing show? he was in. Yeah, that show that all the teenage girls, the angsty exactly. one, the, the my new, so-called life. Yes. Right? Movie. <laughs> Let me tell you, you know, when I was running radio stations, we had him play uh, concerts for us, and he hits on everything that moves. He's one of those. Yes. Mm. Oh, my God. Those blue eyes. Okay. Some Watch mu- out. I'm telling you, he's trouble. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, some music news. So... <laughs> You know, we're always talking about Detroiters are resourceful. They're hardworking. They get it done. Uh, Here's evidence. So a local musician, Sam Austins, he was given one hour notice. Post Malone played at Freedom Hill Mm -hmm. last week. Sam got called an hour before. Hey, Post Malone's looking for a Detroiter to open up. Can you do it? And he did it. Wow. <laughs> you you get an opportunity to open for one of the biggest names in music right you now. You get your butt you, there you, and you do yeah, it. Yeah, you drop what you're doing. And he did a great job. 
Um, so, you know, there's also this kind of thing about naming streets after musicians. Aretha you know, we got, Franklin yeah, Boulevard. Yeah, we got Stevie Wonder. Um, <laughs> the latest one is Bob Seger. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he went to Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor. So apparently a street on the ground, there's a campaign to name it Bob Seger Boulevard. So to bring awareness to this whole thing, uh, the radio station 94.7 WCSX played Bob Seger's songs for 24 hours straight over yeah, the weekend. Yeah, this is the big classic rock station. Yeah. This is not the first time they did this. They actually made the uh, Glenn Fry Street that was named after him from the Eagles. Oh, okay. Uh, they made that happen. They made that it That was their okay. effort. So yeah. this is their latest, 24 Hours of Bob. Uh, America's Got Talent. It's going to be in Detroit for auditions, November 12th. I you love this show. I, I This is one of my guilty pleasures. I don't watch a lot of reality TV. But I like love America's Got Talent. I will say Nick Cannon was a better host than uh, uh, Tyra Banks. Oh, see, I didn't like Nick Cannon. I thought he just tried way too hard. He Nick mm. Cannon, when he started, was not very good. He got a lot okay. better as time went on. And by the, t- by the time he was uh, finishing up his run there, he was very good. Do you think I could sit in for Howie Mandel some night? I, you know, I don't think anybody would notice a difference. Yeah, I think <laughs> to completely. be honest, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. you just have to not touch anybody else's hands. I'll bump elbows, right? And this, this yeah. is what I would walk around on Halloween every year, I'd wear a suit and carry a little great case with me and say, "Open the case." There you I go. wonder who the judges are this year. Do we know? I don't know. Stern's been off for a while now. Uh, yeah, it, it's got to be uh, Heidi Klum's got to be back, mm-hmm. and um, Spice I, the Spice Girl. The spi- what's her name? Uh, Mel B. Yeah, Mel B. Who's oh, fantastic. Sure. She's she's, she's pretty good. cool. You know. Yeah. All, oh, and Sa- Simon Cowell was the fourth judge last year. Oh, ah. uh, that's right. So, I believe he's back. Right, and you know it's a lot of Brits. Uh, well, uh, hey, and, and frankly, three of the four are not from America. Exactly. But still, <laughs> but, but they're judging American talent. Yeah. So it's the only Midwest audition site. You know, so. All you talented folks, get on out there, sign let's, up. Let's go podcast for five minutes on stage. Yeah, do you think that would? Yeah, no. They take all really kinds <laughs> of talents. I mean, I don't know if we're good enough for a Vegas show, but I wonder if any of the comedians we know though are going to go up I, and, I and do yeah, some sets. Some I would of love the to see musicians that. that we know. Yeah, they've broken through some uh, mm-hmm. some people for sure. Mm-hmm. So one last piece, I just want to direct people to our website where you can see the interviews I did at Movement as a whole article up there on the on our web page. So yeah, you talked to uh, a number of the performers mm-hmm. about uh, not only the movement festival and what that means for the the edm scene but also where detroit fits in the music scene nationally it was interesting yeah it's interesting i asked four different artists the three same questions and they're all detroiters and uh so i want you to go check that out all right we're going to talk about some of the events that are happening both on stage and in exhibitions around town that's coming up in just a few the d break your guide to detroit's arts and entertainment scene Jag, I know uh, we talked about the Grand Prix, uh, both earlier in this podcast, and we, of course, interviewed them last week, but you actually went down there before the big event happened, right? Yeah, this was really cool. Uh, we put a video up on the Debrief social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, they, call, well, they call it a hot lap. So I wasn't quite sure what I was getting into, but I got an email that morning <laughs> and said, okay, well, you know, if we have an extra space for it if you want to come down. So the folks down there were great, of course. A hot lap. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've had sex like that, too. I, I, <laughs> You, you know, you'd think that you'd stop and we just meet you with silence when you hit every one of oh, these no, jokes. Oh, no, I enjoy he, it. He I relish that. it. He, I, you you like him. the awkward yes. silence, don't you? I do. I he, like... He aims to get that. Yes. All right. And I get that in sex quite often. Back to the race car hot lap. <laughs> I just love that hot lap is a thing that we're it just does like sound, talking about. It does about. sound like yeah. sexy, doesn't it? She's, yeah. She's not the only woman who feels that way. All right. So oh, anyway. Uh, just saying. All right. Go on. Yes. What happened? So the race car version of hot lap. So I wasn't sure what I was getting in, get into. I drive down to Belle Isle uh, last week, I believe it was Thursday morning, and I, I didn't know what was going on, but I, I show up and I park and I walk over the bridge and down and everything, and there's a line of people. There were VIPs from different media outlets mm. and then different sponsors for the Troy Camp Prix. There were some people from GM, Citizen bank so on and so forth and they have uh basically stock cars that, that are you know got a lot of juice in them a lot of horsepower there were some camaro ss's some cadillac sports cars it was just luck of the draw oh okay. um and they they get you up there they put the full they put the stocking on over your head and then the full helmet and then like the uh it's called the hans device where it keeps it hooks into the back of the helmet and goes over your shoulders and your chest hans h like, yeah like it's either h a n s or h a h n s i'm not sure how to spell okay. it exactly but that's what they call it it's what the race car drivers wear in the car okay. so you actually can't really turn your head left or right you're all like locked into place it's a safety thing obviously sure. so it gets to be your turn and you line up and that's how you line up at number 1 through 8 whichever one they give you and then a professional driver driver rolls up to you and for me it was in a Camaro SS and I'm like 
All right. Here we go. Wow. Mm. So I so you know we're we're getting I'm getting buckled in and everything and asking, "Well, you know, how fast is this thing going to go?" And he was like, "Well, there's the, you know, it's it's a road track here at Belle Isle, so it's only, you know, the straightaways aren't as long as some of the other courses we do, so I'm only going to get you up to about 120 miles an hour." Oh, okay. Oh, only 120 nothing. miles an hour. All right. I go there on 696. Yeah. Uh, you're not <laughs> the just only to keep one. Up with traffic. <laughs> and and those guys always wind up right tailgating on me, everybody who <laughs> drives that fast. <laughs> it it's might be me. 696 <laughs> in the lodge 60 miles an hour in the left lane and 100 in the right lane seriously for, but anyway so on the track so I'm like well I'm, I'm here for the debrief I need to get video of this so I, and I said do you mind if I shoot video while we're in the car oh no 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 go right ahead so I pull out my phone and he takes off, you know, like like the rock and roller coaster at Disney World and we're going and I'm looking down at my phone make sure the video right <laughs> I started to get a little car sick. Oh, mm. yeah. Because yeah. I didn't even think of it. Like, when I was a kid, I couldn't, like, read a book read, in a car right. because I'd get car sick. And I'm like, oh, well, I didn't, you know, I'm like, I'm like I should have just looked up and just videoed it. Sure. And so I'm like, oh, I've said, like, 10 seconds. Like, let me just put the phone down. I'm, oh. like, I'm going around it. And then we're going around. And I'm like, well, I got to get some more video. And I get some more video. And the video, it doesn't look like you're going that fast until you hear the tires squeal around the corners, you know. Mm-hmm. And and he was zooming it. And then there are a couple times you see, like, how many feet until the corner like 800 feet he's got to slow it back down and then he speeds it back up yeah. it really felt like a roller coaster That's and it, so it cool. was a it was a really cool experience i'm glad to do it i was ready to be done when i got out of Wait, the car you didn't lose your lunch in the car no did i didn't i didn't get sick but i was he, he I, I was a little as soon as he realized yeah. Absolutely, yeah a little bit a little bit uh, a little bit jumpy and i was like all right i'm i'm, I'm going to stop this i wonder how many times a day they have to clean out those cars oh, after they do something like this Eek. with, with like but little the, the barf bags like, in w- the dash i would have been fine if i hadn't been looking down at my phone and that was right. i was so obsessed with like getting the video for social media because I'm that guy, and I'm like, oh, why did I do that? If I had just been looking up the whole time, yeah, I would have been a blast. It messes with your, right. with your equilibrium. equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, equilibrium. And I'm just like, oh, but I got to thank the folks at Grand Prix. They were tremendous to us. Everybody there was so friendly, so professional, um, and it was a really cool thing to get to experience ahead of the race. And they're just a first class organization all the way. Nice but, shot of adrenaline to uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 fortunately, they had bottles of water on ice when you got out because it was hot last Thursday. Oh, that's right. So I yeah, got yeah, out of that yeah. car. And I Sweating. chugged a whole bottle and we were good to go. All right. Uh, we've got a fan here at the Debrief Guys, and he's doing something very cool for the homeless. We're going to talk about it next. This is the Debrief. Want more? Your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene. Go to the debriefdetroit.com. All right, Becky, walk us through some of the things that are happening around town. Sure thing. Uh, Fisher Theater, Motown the Musical, still going on through June 10th, so catch that. Um, Now, this is kind of traditionally a lower time of year for theaters. Right, everybody wants to be outside. Right, So, but what's a good time to do is buy season tickets. And right. so you can use subscriptions for the upcoming season. So a couple places around town, you're going to want to go on their websites and grab those. So Michigan Opera Theater, uh, the, their subscription to their 2018-2019 opera and dance seasons are on sale. It starts in October. There's some great highlights. Like as far as opera, they got Barber of Seville. Dance, they've got the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. So some high quality shows. Um, Open Book Theater is doing their season tickets now. Five shows. And also also, Wayne State's Hillbury Theater um, season tickets are on sale now, and you can save up to 25% when you do that. Um, and oftentimes, you can switch your tickets around, too, so great thing to check out. Uh, the Ringwald Theater in Ferndale, they've got company uh, closing this weekend on June 11th. Powabic Pottery, uh, they've got a fun event coming up, a 28th annual House and Garden Show. So if you've been wanting to check out uh, Powabic, this is a perfect time to do it because they've kind of got a, everything going on. Uh, it's a whole weekend, Friday to Sunday, June 8th to 10th. You're celebrating ceramics, you're seeing their latest work, and you get to see work from over 80 artists. And also, what I like is um, the mock-ups they have of like architectural displays. So yep. if you're thinking about getting a backsplash or your fireplace redone, you can kind of see what it would look yeah, like. Yeah, that's from- a cool place. I'm thinking about getting, uh, cause, you know, because we need the house numbers on the brand new oh, house. Oh, yeah, so I'm that'd be a about good thing to do. Pulavic pottery. Yeah. yeah but the, and they've done the groundbreaking, I think, now, because so, they're expanding. They are expanding, they're- which they really need the space. It's Yeah. yeah. But um, this weekend, too, you can and also get a tour of the facility. There's going to be live music. So great for the family, really. Yeah, and good for that place. I mean, they, you know, 
I mean, they do gem. so much. I used to work there back in the day. Did and you it's really? Just, okay. Yeah, it was one of the funnest places I ever. Did worked. you have your own urn or? No, I was on the business side uh, and the curation I, I side. I guess kiln urn is when you kiln, die. Urn is what yeah. the Undertaker <laughs> would bring yeah. on the WWF <laughs> back in the I day. Ha- I hope I don't have an urn. First, you fall here. in the kiln, then you get put. That in the could urn. happen. Oh, yeah, sh- yeah. Um, so those of you with pooches, uh, dog days of summer at Elk Club uh, this Saturday, June 9th. So it's a dog-friendly party on their outdoor patio. So you can bring a dog if you have one, or you can adopt one there. That's so, awesome. I I'm, know. I'm a big so, uh, adoption person, me so too. that's great. So adoption event. And then they're going to have a raffle uh, benefiting the Friends of Detroit Animal Care and Control. There's going to be a pool for the dogs. And then Grim Feeder, um, which I love that name. Of the, <laughs> me too. <laughs> they do prop pups. Um, they're cooking up a vegan brunch for the people, and also they're cooking up treats for the dogs. So got it all um now we talked about the arab american film festival portion of cinetopia Mm -hmm. the whole thing's going on now through june 10th it's mainly in ann arbor um there's tons of films at the state theater and michigan theater but one of the films they're bringing to detroit because it's about gilda radner who was born and raised here so it's Ah. called love gilda that's going to be showing at the dia this sunday june 10th at 2 p.m and you're going to want to order tickets in advance that'll be a popular one yeah, I'd be very interested in seeing that. Yeah. As somebody who's dabbled in comedy. It, She's it's fascinating oh, God, to see just the such a great, yeah. All right, coming up in just a few, we'll talk about food and drink. I would like to say to the people of Detroit, I can feel the difference. Come down to Detroit. The Detroit Institute of Arts. The Detroit Zoo. The Michigan Science Center. Detroit Cocktail Classic. The Arab American National Museum. The Little Caesars Arena. The Henry Ford. Eastern Market. The QY. The Detroit Derby Girls. Motor City Brew Tours. I think everybody can feel it. It's a comeback story that everybody's been rooting for. Detroit is moving. And you're listening to The Debrief. And you are listening to The Debrief. The Debrief. The Debrief. The Debrief. <laughs> All right, guys, good news. We have a fan. Yay. Just Just one. one. Just one. Just one. But he's been listening to this uh, podcast for months. Every week. Well, if you're going to have a fan, at least we have a loyal fan. Yes, we do. Uh, His name is Matt Kirchner, and he emailed us out of the blue, and Mm -hmm. he he told us a little bit about his story, and he's involved in a very cool project. I mean, really, he is the project. Mm -hmm. He is spearheading this, Uh, and it is a a project to benefit homeless people. Uh, Oh, cool. And so he has teamed up with a local uh, sportswear company called Love Life Sports. Swagger. Uh, and so I sat down with Matt and also with uh, Bernard Bentley. That's his nickname. His given name is Trellis Bernard Mercer, but he goes by his <laughs> his middle name. Uh, by the car Bernard. he wants to drive? Yeah, yes. I love it. <laughs> I could be Jags Jaguar. Yeah, oh. There you go. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, we all need cool car names, we don't do. we? We yeah. do. I could be Seth Saab. Yeah, that's not as cool as I want it to be. No. We'll work on it. <laughs> Seth Subaru. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I sat down with the two of them. Uh, let, let's start with Love Life Swagger. Uh, I talked to Bernard and I asked him what this clothing line is all about. And he explained it in really kind of uh, terms that r- captured the essence of what this is about. Okay. Love Life Swagger is, it's like a thing that everyone embodies. Love kind of speaks for itself, but it's all about individuality and, and creativeness. So everyone has a certain piece of love, you know, in their heart for whoever there is, and you know, your mother, your girlfriend, your wife, husband. You know, life is it's like the individuality part, the part about the struggles and the things we go through, which is why I really want to work with Matt over here. And then the swagger is like your individuality, how you deal with those two things. Like everyone deals with everything on an individual level level. So whether you're like a homeless person on the street or a multi-billion dollar CEO, you have love, life, and swagger. Yeah, and it's actually symbolized by a heart, mm-hmm. an ankh, and then like a little tuxedo. Oh, I like that. I love it. I feel like it should be a game. Like instead of F, Mary kill, it should be... <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you know, which one of us would be love, which one of us would be life, and which one of us would be swagger. Oh, my God, that's Becky so would be obvious. swagger. Be- so you and obvious. I have no swagger. Yeah. Becky would be swagger. I'm not sure any of us have swagger. <laughs> I'll be really honest with you guys. <laughs> well, if we had to choose. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be love. I'm not a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> anyway, when I was talking to Bernard, uh, I asked him you know, about the trends that he is seeing in streetwear fashion. And here's what he told me. Streetwear fashion went from baggy to, you know, slim fitted or tight. The casual and formal wear intertwined with, uh, with streetwear. So now, you know, hey, you can throw on some dress pants with some Converse. 
<laughs> or some chucks. So a lot, a, lot, a lot of the different levels of fashion have blended. So it's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a, it's a good thing because uh, you can really be extremely creative and do a lot because things have uh, kind of crossed paths. Like, uh, you know, you can, people are putting zippers on T-shirts and zippers on the bottom of jeans. And, and who's ever had a pair of jeans with zippers on the bottom? So like <laughs> now, like, you know, you can get a lot more creative and it's a lot more accept, acceptable, which opens the door to a lot more people being able to get in because like hey you can just do anything so that's why i th- said earlier it takes some of the realness out sometimes but um i mean i i tread that line very very finely on just kind of going with some of the trends but i still make sure i have a level of classicness and i still have to you know still have to make sure you're not you know putting yourself out the game and not you know being lame and like oh you know this guy is too old you know he's not getting with the time so it's it's a thin line I'm not sure that I'm the best judge of how to walk the line between <laughs> classicness and streetwear fashion. You think? But I do think I need some zippers on the bottom of my jeans. Clearly. You know? Yes. I think that would be a good look for me. I think that could work. Yeah. <laughs> I got nothing. He has nothing. <laughs> I, I, for, I, I'm not often speechless. This is one of those moments. <laughs> he has Fashion, nothing to not, say. Not, not your thing, Jack, huh? <laughs> I am sitting here in a t-shirt and cargo shorts yeah. and New Balance sneakers, also oh, known as dad shoes. <laughs> boy. Uh, All right. So, you're like the um, crazy, stupid love, you know, when Ryan Gasling. Not a movie out. I've seen. Yeah. Oh, what, see, I mean, I'll, for Come the on, first yeah. time, I will actually back him <laughs> <laughs> on him not seeing a movie. Crazy Stupid Love? Yeah, no. Okay, that is your assignment, you no, guys. You no, 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 Why? A veto. I still got to see The Godfather no, first. Yes, come on. No, you'd like it. Ugh. It's funny. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so I asked uh, Bernard about uh, one of the fashions that was there, because uh, one of the, the t-shirts and the hoodies that you would see in there uh, just had the letters FCK. LV. Okay, can, so you were in his store. I was in the store. store. Yeah, it's it's okay. and it's it's a s- tiny little space uh, on Grashit, like right downtown. Uh, but there's all kinds of cool fashion, cool designs. I, I love these hoodies that had uh, like half a lion's face on it uh, and said Detroit on it. Oh, nice! A lot of cool stuff. But one of them that really caught my attention I, was I would assume what FCKLV stands for. Yes. It was, it was, to me, it would be somebody who's single and bitter. <laughs> well, yeah. Here's what it means. The FCKLV. <laughs> So FCKLV is a acronym or short for f- love. <laughs> it represents like the moment after the breakup. You know, when you break when you and your girlfriend break up or wife or whatever, those first 60 seconds after the breakup, you're like, "Oh man, I hate this." You got that it's that whole feeling of f- love. I mean, obviously days later you may be like, "Oh, you know, I miss you or I want it to work out," but it's that first 60 seconds after the breakup. That's how you feel. So people look at it and like, oh, you're negative or, oh, you know, you're bitter. I'm like, no, I'm just expressing what I felt the moment after a relationship. Don't feel it now, but this is what I feel. I've been there. Yep. They're, they're, We've all been there. Right. Becky, you've been married for like 50 years. You haven't been there. 50 years. <laughs> I've been married in October. It'll be 23 years. Well, congratulations. Yeah. How Do you old remember you that feeling? Got better? Uh, 25. 25. <laughs> Yeah. Do I remember what? That 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 F love feeling? Yeah, did you have a bad breakup before you got married? Well, I I have never no one has ever broken up with me. Have you broken up oh! with someone? <laughs> How many hearts have you broken prior to being a married woman? You're always the dumper, never the dumpy. I am, but I remember that feeling just when things aren't going right or things like. That's not the same. No, she no. no. You are not allowed to buy any of this clothing, all right? You do not (laughs) understand. Your fair point. Plus, you you know, I was like teen in college, so it's different. If if I see you wearing one of these, I'm going to call BS. I I have have had my heart broken by. By several women who just, they, you know, they weren't feeling, oh, you know what, yes. you know what, that, you were just a rebound, sorry. Oh, what? Yep. I, I'm still salty over some of them. You're mm-hmm. allowed to wear the clothing. All right. Okay. In That's fact, fair. given those cargo pants, we should probably get you into this clothing. I think we really <laughs> should. Is there going to be a debrief JAG makeover <laughs> after this interview? <gasps> there might need oh. to be. 
Oh. Uh, you would not be the first friends of mine that have right. attempted a makeover. I want to do the queer eye for the straight guy. No, but I here's, see but here's some the thing. zipper you, jeans in your future. You see this thing on my finger, this little wedding band? Yeah. Yes. That means I don't have to try anymore. That is Oof. so, no, that's BS. Right. You still, you need to constantly My wife is super wife. low maintenance. She doesn't care. I, I just try, dress up to go to care. dinner once in a while. Yeah. Like, you know. No, 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 no. We're going to get you an FCK LV hoodie and we're going to put it behind glass and it's going to say in case of emergency or... Break glass. Yeah, break glass. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think my wife would Don't enjoy that very much. Don't ever give up trying. That's <laughs> rule number one. All right. So the big question is, you know, we've talked to Love Life Swagger. We talked to Bernard. What does that have to do with helping the homeless? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the answer is uh, found in this guy, Matt Kirshner, who uh, basically he was homeless himself at one point, right? Wow, he yeah. was living with an aunt uh, and then uh, at age 18 was kicked out wow. and he found himself on the streets. Wow. Uh, as a teenager. As a, yeah. as a teenager. And, uh, you know, faced homelessness himself and has fortunately overcome it at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, I have a lot of perceptions in my mind, what I think of when I think of homeless. You know, like if Mm. you say homeless person, you you think... You know, Vietnam vet, things go wrong. They're, you know... Or somebody who's got a substance abuse problem. Right, you think about a million sort of, different things. Sort of yeah. image. And, and this guy oh, not fit at all. Yeah. none of that. I mean, mm-hmm. you talk to him, bright guy, uh, really motivated, hardworking, uh, was an audio engineer and knew how to build self-taught. Oh, that hits home. I know, right? Like, like uh, just amazing, amazing guy. And this was his effort to give back uh, to and help out other people who found themselves in the same situation that he found himself in. So he's making these right track backpacks, which are basically backpacks for the homeless that contain a number of resources that they need in order to uh, you know, get back on the right track. Right, Pull themselves right. up by their bootstraps kind of thing. Yeah. So I asked Matt, what is in the backpacks? And here's what he said. Within the backpack, um, there's going to be multiple pieces of paper. On the first one is going to be a map of the city of Detroit with numbers correlated uh, on the back to homeless shelters. So they always know that there's a place to stay. Um, and on the second paper is going to be how to get insurance, how to get bridge card, how to get um, you know all this government aid that they're eligible for that they may not know about. And once they're eligible and um, receiving some sort of government aid, I'm going to be able to get them cell phones as well. So I'm going to ca- try to make it two or three times a week where I'm walking around and see if I can find the same people and help them if they need a ride to go get their, um, their state ID or anything like that. I'm going to be able to provide that for them as well. Wow. And, and that was what was amazing about talking to Matt is that it it was just small things. They were just resources that he did not know were available to him. That's and a so lot true. of these folks probably don't know now. And a lot of these folks exactly. probably didn't, don't know. And it all fits together and it just, it makes sense because a lot of the nonprofit work that I do, you know, aims to reach people and empathize with different situations. And you might take care of one small problem, but then it leads to the next thing. So the fact that he's also trying to do a continuum of care is yeah. really amazing. He's not like just dropping off a peanut butter sandwich. To somebody, you know, that's fulfilling somebody's basic needs, but but to get on a path to be independent is a whole nother thing. So I really applaud him for you, that. You, you talk about our first world problems. We complain where it was 90 some degrees last week right. or, or it's below zero in the wintertime here. And then knowing where those shelters are really can make a difference. It can exactly. really save somebody's life. Yeah. So I asked Matt about the inspiration for the backpack and he told me. When I was 18 years old, I was homeless for a brief period of time, and a random stranger stopped me and helped me out. And he gave me $5 and a bag full of bottles, but the biggest thing that he gave me was guidance. And he directed me into uh, the Department of Human Services, and from there, I was able to get a bridge card, not have to worry about getting food, and I got a job three days later. Um, the biggest thing that happened to me was I wanted to make sure that I was able to give that back, um, so this is kind of my efforts to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's funny how one small act can just send somebody down the right path. Exactly. Nope. I mean, that's what right track with, with the name of these backpacks is. You just the, the, all these some of these people need is just one act of kindness, and and the, their whole life can get turned around. Yeah, and Matt's got a job now, and and he's working, and you know, I met his brother there as well when they were doing the interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the connection between Matt and Love Life Swagger is that he had this idea for backpacks, and he was basically going down through the community and saying, "Is there somebody who will help with this? Oh, you know, I need to make the backpacks." Packs, yeah. And that's what Love Life Swagger is doing. Wow. You know, that Bernard said, "Yep." I'm do in. It. I will do this. I think this is a great project. I'm, you know, I care a lot about this community. I want to get involved with the community, and we, this is a project we'll support. Uh, and so he's actually got a GoFundMe campaign. 
Uh, and he's not looking to raise a lot of money, right? He's looking to raise two thousand dollars. Oh wow! So That's not a lot. No. He's he's over yeah. halfway there at oh, this point. Okay. Uh, you know, and and so hopefully we can get him across the finish line. Yeah. And that will pay for making the backpacks and. Well, I asked him that okay. question. The money is going to be putting towards creating the backpacks, and then also I want to put socks. Two days worth of food and two water bottles in there. Um, the reason I'm putting the food in there is so that they have no excuse not to use those resources. Because my excuse was, well, I needed to find uh, money for food or else I'm not going to eat today. But once I didn't have to worry about the food, I was able to use those resources. Uh, so the money is going to be put towards a um, little bit of food, laminating those pieces of paper, the backpacks, and then I'm considering putting socks and a toothbrush in there because those are two things that like you know socks go really fast and then just having that toothbrush it was pretty key for me as well so yeah you don't think about those little things but socks oh no he hit right on it that's the most requested item at homeless shelters really really Mm -hmm. we've learned that so yep yeah so where he is right now uh is i sat down with him last week he is expecting to see prototypes this week of oh, the backpacks. Of the backpacks. Okay. Oh. So, I, I mean, and this is a guy who is really realizing this. I mean, he's... Making it happen. Yeah, he really is making it happen, and he's making it happen, uh, frankly, on a on a shoestring budget. Shoe, exactly. So he is yeah. hustling. Uh, this is something that's really important to him, uh, and he's going out and doing. So we will post a link to the GoFundMe uh, campaign uh, on our webpage for this episode. Yeah. Uh, you can just go in there and uh, you know make a donation and help out and support this. But I, I just thought this this was a great project. Uh, and the guy is also about to launch his his own podcast. Uh, oh. Which I which is kind of cool i mean yeah. so it turns out the, the way he found out about us is he was in a facebook group uh, about podcasting and he asked if there were any detroit podcasters oh. in uh-huh. and apparently i replied uh, <laughs> which <laughs> sounds like something i, I spend way like too you. much time on facebook yeah, that sounds uh, like and you. so we started listening uh, a couple oh, months ago yeah. uh and he, and he emailed us and reached out to us and uh you know it's so I great that. that we have a fan <laughs> <laughs> and, and somebody who's doing inspiring well, things in the city exactly. too yeah. we don't have many fans but damn it they're, they're good quality fans, fans. they're, they're quality yeah. people <laughs> well I like this whole piece too because there's also the dignity like you know when you're homeless it's you don't want to look dirty and you know right. and to, this nice backpack with some resources it just is like a little okay maybe I can stand tall Yeah, so we want to salute the work that uh, both Matt and Bernard are doing. Uh, Please, if you can support them, uh, take a moment to do so. Coming up in just a few, we'll talk about the stand-up comedy shows that are happening around town. The D. 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 The D. Breathe. Food and drink. Becky, let's talk about what's going on in the food scene. Sure thing. So, there's a place in New York called Lions, Tigers, and Squares. Oh, my. So, this is... How come he doesn't get awkward silence? Because I don't make sex jokes, at least on this podcast. He didn't actually say anything about it. He just said, oh, my. So, can you guess what it might be? Squares, it's got to be Detroit Pizza, right? It is Detroit Pizza in New York. So um, it's a pizza place that recently opened in Manhattan. They've got the deep dish pizza, a la Buddy's, Cloverleaf, Louis. Um, I am not a fan of Detroit like Pizza. It? I love almost all things Detroit, but no, I'm sorry. Not back, a fan. Back up here. All right. Okay. And, and this is, again, being the new guy yeah. and, and not ordering a lot of pizza. I don't actually know what, what defines Detroit it? pizza is. Okay. So, um, it's deep dish, like, baked in a metal pan, and the the crust is coated with oil such that it almost comes out like a fried crust in a way. It has that really nice crunch, oily crunch. If you care effect. about your arteries. It's not for you, but and it's very doughy. And then the other defining characteristic is the cheese and the toppings are placed first on the crust and then the sauce is dolloped on top so your bread doesn't get soggy the sauce is on top of the cheese yeah. it That's doesn't get soggy from the from the sauce it gets soggy sauce. from the grease well but well, that but kind then of again, it's stuff. nasty i'm sorry i love detroit but i, I just cannot get on board with detroit pizza it's mm-hmm. gross it's unappealing no and just so i fully understand how does yeah. this compare because chicago is also deep dish pizza oh no chicago deep dish is more like a pie so that's like a thinner crust with a lot of uh middle so a lot of sauce a lot of cheese a lot of toppings kind of all squishy in there okay and new york yeah. pizza is super thin. That's the thin crust. Like you can really fold thin, it. That you gotta fold a big slice in your hand and shove That's it. what I like. Even if I buy a DiGiorno and, and Kroger, I'll I'll get I'll get the thin crust. I, that's how I like yeah, my pizza. Yeah. See, I've sort of changed for the like. I like the Chicago or the Detroit pizza. I don't like Chicago pizza. 
Um, but as you get older and like think you realize things are not so good for you and it kind of <laughs> makes my stomach feel bleh. So now I prefer the thin crust for sure. So now there is Detroit pizza in New York. Yeah. So these guys came, they, they tasted buddies and fell in love with it. And they're like, why does every place not have this? What do you mean? These guys came, you mean these aren't even Detroiters? Oh no, no, they're not natives. Jeez. Yeah. It's just two guys and they, um, that's said, cultural appropriation. Took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> that's pizza appropriation. That's not right. If you want to be offended, but hey. And so they are like, we're going to open a place. And these are not just some guys off the street. Right. They're like uh, chefs. They've been on two cooking channel shows and kind of stars of cooking world. And so they have this place and their decor is all Detroit as well. Like 1960s Motown stars. That Every kind of thing Detroit cliche. Yeah. I way know. to go. So I don't know. We'll have to see. We should go take a, take a trip. No, no, no. So here's the thing is all you see all these stories about New Yorkers coming to Detroit because they realize how awesome it well, is sure. here and how much less expensive it is to live mm-hmm. here. You want Detroit pizza? Fine. If you like it, fine. Go Take come it. here, come move here. Don't don't cheap out and just get it <laughs> get it in Brooklyn or whatever but trendy you don't New York like place it this anyway, is. So who cares no, but if you do some... like it, come to Detroit and get the real thing. Don't get some knockoff in New I, York. I agree. This is getting ridiculous. I mean, next thing you know, there's going to be know, a right? big Detroit casino in Las Vegas. It's just going to oh, get wait. ridiculous. <laughs> oh, wait. Hey, I've been there. I it's kind of entertaining. Spreading the love. <laughs> you, Spread how was the, the love. pizza? <laughs> <laughs> didn't get the pizza. So here's a fun fact, though. Okay, so you didn't, you probably won't know this, how Detroit pizza started. Uh, I, I don't know. know this. So the deep pans, the metal pans they were baked in, it started as... Um, Ford pan- hubcaps. No, but close. Pans for auto parts that you would carry oh, around. Really? Auto parts. Yeah, in the factories. And so then they decided to make pizza, bake it on these pans, and... Um, bring it back to the factory for lunches for the workers. With a side so, of motor oil. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you said... I the, assume they clean them The well. oil soaks into the crust. What type of oil are we talking it, about? Is it 10W40 or yeah. is it... <laughs> Gross. Yeah, so... Anyways, all right. That was a that was a contentious topic. I didn't think it was going to be. You never know. It was pizza. Yeah, okay. it's pizza. We have very strong. Let's views. go to craft cocktails. <laughs> I think this is something we all enjoy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Sugar House was kind of the um, the jumpstart, if you will, of the craft cocktail movement here in Detroit. Mm-hmm. So they opened in 2011. And I tell you, I remember first going there like, oh, this is cool, this speakeasy. And it was something that we did not have in the city before. And so they've just been named Sugar House by Esquire Magazine as one of the 21 best bars in America. That's, nice. That's cool. I know. 20- Put that one on the board. Yep. So you, they, they were really singled out for their daiquiri. That's what came out on top. Now, when I think of daiquiri, I think of like overly sweet and like not something I would normally order. But Sugar House makes like a perfectly balanced one, the sweet and the sour and just, yeah. So that's what they really highlighted in the Esquire article. But you can go there, get all the classics like the Sazerac, the Slow June Fizz, Last Word, all those like. I taught myself to make a Sazerac because Sazerac is the first cocktail cocktail ever. ever. And it came and it comes out of New Orleans. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, It comes out of, you know, where you spent a few years. Uh, But I don't actually. I I don't love them. No. There are very few flavors I don't like. Uh, black licorice is one. Yeah, the anise and yeah. there. Yeah, right there with you. Yeah, I, I don't either. Yeah. Um, what about the last word? Do you guys like that? What is that? I don't even know what that That's is. That's a Detroit cocktail. Okay, and it's made with chartreuse. It's it's yummy. I don't I even know what that. chartreuse is. It's like okay, well, it's see, like a Sherwin Williams right. color. You guys really need to get out. <laughs> I'll take you, and we'll have one. We'll cheers together. All right, let's go get craft cocktails. That, you, you know that that's her like default response when she doesn't know the answer. She says, "You guys need to get out." Wait, what was the question? Yeah, see, she missed that. <laughs> I did miss the question. No, I don't know what is chartreuse? chartreuse? Oh, it's, it's a, a color, right? It's a Sherwin Williams. Really, really, really old liqueur, originally made by monks from herbs. Now nah, she's just making stuff. I'm not up. making it she up. She pulled that one out. Google yeah. your business. You know, when you guys don't know anything, you just Google it. I actually knew this. <laughs> oh, oh, she's getting testy now. What it's ups? getting late. What ups? <laughs> All right. So you know how some chefs in town, they've just been getting national attention. Sure. It, it, there's yet another one that we've got to give a shout out to. Lena Saraini is Selden Standers pastry chef. She's 25 years old. She's been named a semifinalist for the Eater Young Guns class of 2018. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So this is a national thing. Um, it was started in 2012. It recognizes up and coming uh, front of the house, back of the house talent in the restaurant industry all across the nation. 
so the list includes semi 50 semifinalists. So she's one of those 50. And then the finalists will be announced later this month. So right. good luck. If you haven't had her stuff, amazing breads, desserts, and she's always seasonal and new. I um, haven't been to Selden Standard yet. This is one of those places. Okay. That I, you I, can I, get a last word there. Look, my so. wife, my wife and I don't get out much, but that is on our short list of restaurants it's we want to so get to. Good, you guys, right. you yeah. got to make a reservation way in advance, though, right? That's one well, of those. they take a certain number of reservations, and then they they want to be a neighborhood place, so they do have a certain number of walk-ins, but then you just need to go early or a little bit off time. We got to eat like what time my parents eat dinner, you know, like four o'clock exactly. hometown buffet and time. Yeah. Now's the time to go because it's, it's bigger because their patio is open. So okay. that's a, a good thing to keep in mind. So one thing I just want to quick mention, there's a rum and tequila festival happening at Easter market this Friday, June 8th. They're billing it as Polynesian Luau meets Mexican fiesta. Fusion. It's Done. fusion. I'm in. Ole. <laughs> Welcome to the D. Free D. D. Free Funny stuff. All right, Jag, I need some funny in my life. What All right. The Sintas, the Sintas are coming to Andiamo, Andiamo Showroom in Warren. Uh, that's the big show this week. Uh, in other news, The Good Place, that's that show on NBC that's got Huntington Woods native Kristen Bell in mm-hmm. it. They've launched their own podcast talking about the show, and we're always uh, up for promoting other podcasts. Seth, you've checked it out, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge Kristen Bell fan. I've been a huge Kristen Bell fan. Uh, Since before you moved to Michigan, even? Yeah, no. Really? I, oh, I, oh, okay. oh, no. I mean, I watched Veronica Mars, and that was a fantastic She's television great. show. Uh, and I'm a huge Ted Danson fan as well. I was a huge Cheers fan. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, and uh, the two of them together in a show was just amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I wanted to watch The Good Place. I remember seeing the promo and thinking it was funny when it first came out. It's, they've done two seasons now, though they've been okay. short seasons. I think it's 12 or 13 mm-hmm. episodes. And uh, it is, I think, the smartest comedy I've ever ever seen. Seriously? Yes. Something to binge watch. I haven't checked oh, it out yet. Oh, yeah, I've never oh, seen yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's just so smart. And the show creator is Mike Shore, who was involved in uh, Parks and Rec. Okay. And, oh, I love that show. Yeah. I, the basic premise is... Uh, Kristen Bell plays this woman who is an awful, terrible, horrible human being. <laughs> That's and hard to believe. Yeah. So, <laughs> so sweet. Yeah. And, and she dies and she goes to the good place. You know, it's they, they, they're careful not yeah. to say heaven or hell or anything like that. She okay. goes to the good place okay. and she's clearly not supposed to be there. Like it's a mistake. It's like a clerical error that <laughs> she is there. And this place is run by Ted Danson. Uh, he's not God. He's like, you know, there's a hierarchy and he's... he's they don't, yell, yell, out they they don't yell out everybody's name when they walk into the room right no <laughs> no right and it's not and there's no angels nothing like that okay. but uh and, and then there's lots and i don't want to give anything away but there are lots and lots of twists as you get through the first season uh and it's it's really amazing but it's really really s- smartly done so i actually listen to this podcast because i'm a such a big fan of the show mm-hmm. and uh, is that the aim of the podcast for like yeah super it's fans? it's the official you know nbc uh podcast of the show oh, okay and it's hosted by one of the actors uh mark evan jackson who plays one of the smaller uh roles he's not he's not in the first several episodes and then he eventually comes on the show uh in the first episode which is the only one that's been published so far they interviewed the creator mike shore so and they talk about how he came up with the show and it's really interesting to hear the backstory and how he cast Kristen bell and how he cast ted dance apparently those two were friends they'd done a movie together oh and so they knew each other even before uh they they got cast oh, okay. together so in the show and, yeah, yeah and but uh, and you know he talks about the casting roles because it's a very diverse cast and, mm-hmm. and talks about how the casting agent was told okay you have to go get a, you know an indian or a pakistani woman with a british accent who's like seven feet tall and and how they got <laughs> on doing that and yeah so if you're a fan of the show uh first of all if you're not a fan of the show watch it it's okay it's very, step very one good. yeah and it, once you become a fan of the show which is unquestionably Guaranteed. going to happen oh. <laughs> listen to the podcast it's fantastic that's cool it's one of those it's one of those things where yeah you're, you you know what i do think we'll get as big as someone will do a podcast about the creation of the debrief podcast yeah you think so that's what i was going <laughs> to say that's meta. what i was going to say is look at all these big brands like nbc realizing the power of podcasts it's something to be said I there know. Yeah. Uh, other news, Our Detroit has their Best of Detroit uh, awards. Uh, Coco won Best Female Comedian. I worked with her when she was doing mornings on WJLB, and I was next door, Channel 955. She is hilarious. Not only is she a wonderful person, but she is funny as all get out. Congratulations to her for winning Best Female Comedian in Detroit. Our friends over at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle won Best Comedy Venue, so no surprise there. That's been around forever. Yeah, this, I mean, this venue has, uh, I mean, it's been in multiple 
multiple locations and multiple iterations over the years, but this venue is legendary. I mean, for big national comedians who first start touring across the United States, this is one of the destination stops. And didn't you say Mark Ridley kind of created the modern format of comedy shows? Yeah, so the he went out, um, you know, if you know back stand-up comedy in like the late 70s when, when Mitzi Shore was running, uh, what was she running? Her, her comedy shop out there in, in Los Angeles, and there were a couple of clubs. Yeah, was, just like the comedy know, store. Uh, yeah, and, the, yeah, and these yeah. are the days when Letterman was there and Leno was there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, sh- he went out there just for a couple months okay. and saw a stand-up comedy. I don't even know if it was a couple months. We, uh, Mike Jeter and I... Um, you know, interviewed him when we did the Detroit versus Detroiters podcast. He was our very first guest on the very first episode of that podcast, and he told us the whole story. Uh, but he came back here and decided he wanted to open up a club for for stand up comics and start putting on shows. But he is credited with creating the three comic format that is so popular these days. How does so you, that work? So you have the f- the first comic, which is the the host or the MC, who goes out and will do five minutes or ten minutes of comedy, right? And then they'll bring on the second person. That's the feature okay. uh, right and they'll do 15 20 minutes or whatever and then you've got the headliner who will do 45 minutes or or an hour uh, or whatever it is and so that was really you know his creation his oh. creation is, wow, is that cool. you know Speaking of Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle, they've got Mike Stanley this weekend. Ann Arbor Comedy Showcase has Billy Ray Bauer. Punchline Comedy Lounge in Southfield has uh, Detroit comedian CP. He's on MTV, too. And the Holly Hotel has Matt Holt and Tommy Thompson. Want to close here with always looking at stuff that we find funny here at the debrief. <laughs> I can't get through this with a straight face. Now open downtown. You're giggling. I know. <laughs> <Millinder> Center. <laughs> it's all a giggle. <laughs> Next to the stately courtyard by Marriott Hotel okay. is the nation's first ever combination IHOP and Applebee's. All I have to say is why? <laughs> you you and cut I'm, costs by using the same microwave. <laughs> <sighs> My wife hates Applebee's with the fire of a thousand suns. I'm right there with her. She, I just she, she's not a fan. She had a couple of experiences I, there, and she, she, I always tease her. Hey, there's an app. Please, you want to stop? And she'll just glare at me. Right? No, 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 no. I, I think I I hate IHOP even more though. See, I like IHOP. I don't know if it's the particular grease they use, <laughs> or or the selection of the horrible sugar stuff. pancakes that have like every whipped cream and Ugh. terrible thing for you. I went to the one a couple of weeks ago on Woodward and Twelve Mile. Enjoyed it. I'm out. <laughs> Oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm making a reservation at Southern Standard. Forget this. I have this. not gone back to that one. I don't know. I hope that things have changed because the last time I was there was years ago. How long? I'm just going to say it smelled like an inner city bus ride. <laughs> and I don't I can't even. It's better now. Okay. I had a fine experience when I was there a, 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 about a month ago. I, I won't do Applebee's, but I'll do IHOP. Actually, if my wife goes out of town, I'll go Applebee's because it's like the forbidden fruit for me at this point. <laughs> so I mean, it's the weird. Apple, with, Apple and the logo. The, all the rebellious things you could do when your wife's out of town and he goes to Applebee's. And chicken wings. She doesn't like chicken wings. I'll get a whole plate of chicken wings and watch sports and beer in my you underwear. You're so domesticated. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> This is the D. Detroit. This is the D. Breathe. And there we are on the IHOP <laughs> Applebee's note. I think it's time to end the show. I think so too. <laughs> it's going down. It's uh, it's good in the neighborhood. We, we, we gotta quit while it's we're still ahead. I don't know if we're ahead anymore. <laughs> are we ahead? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I want to say thank you to our guests, Matt Kirchner and Bernard Bentley. Uh, please support this project. These oh, backpacks yeah. for the homeless. I mean, this is a, a, a good project. And a little goes a long way, obviously, what he's doing. Yeah, like I said, we will post that GoFundMe campaign, a link to that in our show notes for this episode, so uh, you can get it there. And by the way, if you want to find out what's going on in Detroit, sign up for our email list because we email out everything that's going on, including links to everything that we talk about in the show right. uh, like this link here also want to thank bailey of detroit history tours uh we hope that she gets her power back on <laughs> maybe she has already by now let's hope maybe uh, she got a text from dte and she's good to go yeah, yeah. and don't forget uh, this thursday we've got dave Waite of motor city pride uh he's gonna stop by and tell us about the big uh the big pride this festival, event festival this weekend grown yeah. significantly over the years it'll be cool to hear about Yeah, we're looking forward to talking to him. You can, of course, subscribe to this wherever you find your favorite podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, we are in Spotify, Google Play Music, all the usual places. Leave a review while you're there, or you can download our 
mobile app. Our website is thedebriefdetroit.com where you can sign up for that email list. And uh, Becky, anything you want to plug? Uh, I added another tour to our website because the summer ones were just so popular. So check out enjoythed.com. Hey, Jack, I don't know if you know this, but Becky there, never been dumped. Uh, We learned that tonight. Yes. Claim to fame. It's just like the tours that she runs. They're just so popular. So popular. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, Jack, what about you? You want to plug anything? Uh, if you like podcasts, if you're into podcasts, if you realize that a podcast can help you promote your business, I can help you get set up and edit and get you soup to nuts, basically, on your podcast. Find me uh, online, jagindetroit.com, or on social, at jagindetroit. Look, NBC, Kristen Bell, and Ted Danson have a podcast. Uh, come on now. You, you should, need too. a podcast, too. <laughs> Uh, also, want to let you know that we are on the Amazon Echo. We've got an Alexa skill. All you have to say is, Alexa, enable the debrief podcast. Say that once, and then you're good to go. And every morning, you can get this podcast in bite-sized chunks. Just say, Alexa, play the debrief podcast. If you've got any announcements you want us to know about, you can send announcements to press, P-R-E-S-S, at the debrief, Detroit.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. The D-Brief. Your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene.